presentation is um, by, by Dr. Uh, Sure Cheng. He's an assistant professor in transport studies at National Cheng Kung University. Good afternoon, everyone. My, my name is Sure Chen. I am an assistant professor in transport studies at National Cheng Kung University in Taiwan. A uh, big thank you to Solutions Plus for inviting me over to share some stories about charging infrastructure deployment in Taiwan. And in the next 10, 15 minutes, I'll very briefly go through the status quo of Taiwan's transport sector and how it's been working on the e-mobility charging infrastructure at the national level and at the local level. And I'll be finishing by the lesson learned. And I think there would be opportunities we could talk in more details in the workshops or in trainings. So first of all, let's have a quick look into the status quo of Taiwan's transport sector. I think the best way to understand Taiwan's transport sector is to look at the model split. Through the national statistical analysis, it's very clear that private vehicles, including scooters, which is very common in this part of Asia or this part of the world, and private cars account for about 75% or even more of our everyday journeys. And whereas for public transport, cycling, walking, those active mobility, I think there is still room to grow. And I think on the left-hand side, you can see the iconic scooter waterfall in Taipei, which you may come across um, the clips or pictures on social media and mainstream media. So it's fair to say that living in Taiwan, we heavily rely on private vehicles. And that also shows the importance of transitioning to electric vehicles, including e-scooters. And we have a look further sort of uh, investigation into the link between transport environment in Taiwan and you could tell just simply because the private vehicle takes the main stage um, of the uh, our everyday trips so it's inevitably private cars and scooters account for I would say again 60 to 70 percent of the transport emissions even though transport only accounts for 12 point uh, about 12.5% of the national total emissions and the fourth biggest emitters. However, road transport accounts for almost 100%, as Joe Drakingly, 95.57% of total transport emissions. And that again shows the importance of transitioning to e mobility in Taiwan, and uh, not just because it's the biggest polluter, but also because it's inevitably in the foreseeable future, people living in Taiwan will still heavily rely on private vehicles as their way uh, everyday living and main modes of transport. If I may share a little bit more information with you from the ownership of private vehicles, and it's even more evident that um, for every 100 population, there are 94.6 scooters. And for every 100 population, there are 34.8 cars in 2020. So you could say for every single Taiwanese, we actually own a scooter for ourselves, uh, which can be quite a um, issue. I think the government has been aware of the ever-growing um, sort of the number of scooters and cars, and there are quite a few um, uh, so policies and strategies that are in place or in pipeline, which uh, we will talk about in the next few minutes. However, I think it's not a smooth sell for the electric mobility development in Taiwan. I think actually back in 2017, the national government actually has announced a few uh, important milestones, including the full electrification of government fleets and buses, and the full electrification of scooters, and the full electrification of cars. But unfortunately, even though those 
um, policies and strategies were announced in 2017. It's actually U10 in 2019 by the government itself is shooting itself in the foot by sort of reversing the policy. And back in 2020 and also this year 2021, the national government even announced the subsidy for gasoline powered scooters. And the subsidy is actually it's almost the same as that of the e-scooters and that was sending quite a sharp wave to the e-scooter industry because you could see in this um, data that even though in 2018, 2019, there was this trajectory of the uptake of e-scooters in Taiwan, in 2020, you could see the setback in this e-scooter industry due to the introduction of the, I would say, the distorted subsidy for gasoline-powered scooters. I think lesson learned is that the government understand that um, from the U-turn, I would say, is that there was sort of a lack of stakeholder engagement actually to understand the industry and also to bring key stakeholders and key players together including the manufacturers and e-charging service providers and users and so on and so forth. So I think slowly on in the 2019 and 2020, the government started from the scratch again um, to pan out a more comprehensive regulation frameworks, um, including uh, say the, from the physical infrastructure for subsidy. I think those four uh, ministries are the, are the key ministries behind this program. And interestingly in Taiwan, the Ministry of Economic Affairs um, usually provide that standardization, the uh, guidelines for installation and the maintenance quality, you could say the quality assurance. And um, because of um, the nature of the ministry, uh, it also can have has to come up with a subsidy program and also have to look into the outside of the spectrum, which is the consumer protection, the consumer's right, to make sure this particular e-charging industry is um, really in place, is well designed and well panned out. And of course, when we talked about e-mobility, inevitably we have to talk about environmental protection administration. For all those e-scooter charging programs, the subsidy programs, are actually derived from funding from the Environmental Protection Administration. So you can see there's a, a clear division of responsibilities between government agencies, whereas Ministry of Economic Affairs is put in charge of electric cars and the Environmental Protection Administration is put in that place to take care of electric scooters. But after all, I think um, in terms of the infrastructure, it's the uh, responsibility of Ministry of Interior to announce the building requirement and the building regulation as well as fire safety regulation. And for the Ministry of Transportation, um, it has the responsibility to look into the space available, such as the parking lots and also the public facilities that has the potential to provide spaces for electric vehicle charging infrastructure. However, I think the national government, despite the fact I think the national government has announced a few um, political and regulatory frameworks, it's all down to the local level that cities have to take actions to really deliver the e-charging infrastructure along with the uh, the transition to e-mobility. So, whereas national governments are 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 in the right position to pan out the the regulatory framework, local governments are the ones who have to be creative, who have to come up with strategies and action plans. So here's an example from Taizhou. The reason that that I picked Taizhou example is simply because uh, Taizhou is now having a very good momentum. Uh, in that transition to e-mobility. Uh, it's the sort of the runner-up to, um, of course, to Taipei as to um, giving out subsidies or encourage the uptake of um, e-mobility. 
So there are a two pronged uh, approaches in place right now in Taicho. One is the public sector leads the way, private sector follows up for the private sector to to set a rule book and to give the incentives. And I think on the other hand, uh, Taichung City also um, sort of encourages the public-private collaboration, which I will be uh, giving a bit more substance in the next few minutes. So interestingly, as opposed to if I may go back uh, to this slide again, that you can see very clearly at the national level, it's all about responsibilities which agency or which ministry has to take care of which, I would say, regulations or framework and subsidy program. Whereas, interestingly, at the local level, it's all about the actions and the problems. So the way they categorize the issues is by categorizing tasks, action plans, be it regulations, be it space, and be it incentives. So for regulation-wise, it's very clear that it comes from uh, the existing national regulations. However, local governments have the ordinance, have the autonomy, the freedom to make their own ordinance under the existing framework. And the low carbon city ordinance is a very popular one in Taiwan so that the governments have the freedom or also have the flexibility to give out incentives, to give out subsidies and to bring in stakeholders. I think space is the issue, not only in Taiwan, but also in many other uh, other countries as well. Uh, by introducing charging facility, we are bringing back the parking spaces, which uh, most of the cities have tried so hard in the past decade to remove. And uh, however, I think um, uh, some cities in Taiwan are, are trying to be creative by utilizing the existing parking facilities um, to um, sort of to allocate uh, 20 here, as we can see, 12% of the space for charging facilities, or at least one charging spot for every 50 spaces, 50 parking spaces. And the Taichung City also has um, gone the extra mile to uh, bring all their government agencies, local government agencies to, together and to um, I would say to mobilize the resources as to how much of the space they can uh, they can use. Not only the transport bureau, uh, on the transport bureau there are definitely parking facilities, but also in museums and in cultural centers and uh, in in sort of libraries, wherever there are uh, extra spaces or abandoned spaces, there are the opportunities for Taichung City or local governments in Taiwan to transform those spaces into something that is more incentivizing for uh, the, the installation of electric vehicle charging facilities. And for incentives wise, I think um, it's, it's usually very hard to bring stakeholders together, especially from the private sector when the signal is not entirely clear. And uh, however, I think for in, in the case in Taiwan, the Environment Protection Bureau always has that extra uh, budget to actually bring in or encourage public sectors to install the charging stations. Here, when we say the public sectors, and they can be the shopping malls, they can be um, the commercial sort of uh, business premises and office buildings, or even universities as well they can apply for the subsidies to install charging stations on their properties or on their land. And eventually, I think uh, for charging at home, it's quite a barrier, which I will touch upon later on as well. Um, so uh, local governments actually are now encouraging the installation of charging spots in housing complexes. I think it's it is very familiar to many of you here simply because Asian cities and countries are usually quite densely populated and we definitely have to find a way for uh, the residents living in the same housing complex to share charging spots and sometimes even installing charging spots in the shared parking garage will be very challenging. And last but not least, I think looking forward, um, 
There are, I think, if I may say, three main key challenges to be resolved or needs to be resolved. Uh, first of all, is the policy and regulations, as you could see early on, that there is a bit of a tricky or gray area for horizontal integration. And it's always a tug of war between Ministry of Economic Affairs that has the budget, has the funding, has the money, and the Ministry of Transportation, which usually is not so well off, as opposed to the Ministry of Economic Affairs and the Environmental Protection Administration, whereas, however, Ministry of Transportation usually owns the properties, the infrastructure, parking lots, railway stations, the key transport interchanges. They do have the potential to transform these spaces into usable charging infrastructure locations or even charging hubs. So there's always a bit of a tug of war between ministries, the key two ministries. But at the end of the day, I think we have to think about which ministry is actually is in charge of decarbonizing transport. I think at the end of the day, it's the Ministry of Transportation who has to wave the flag um, sort of um, of decarbonization of transport. However, if it's in the realm of Ministry of Economic Affairs, that will be really hard to go that extra mile to really decarbonize our transport. I think at the end of the day, at the back of the government's mind, I think that's an issue that will emerge in the long run or in the midterm as well. So there is a lack of horizontal integration and vertical integration, as you might see early on already, the, um, the alignment and streamlining uh, of subsidy programs varied a lot. Whereas at the national level, the Ministry of Economic Affairs also have um, uh, the subsidy program for private sector uh, to install charging spots and charging facilities. However, at the local level, there's something similar in place. And from time to time, that confuses the public sector as to which rules to follow and which regulation to really abide by and which legal binding uh, is more powerful than the other. I think there is a, a gap here in terms of vertical integration. And spaces and location wise, I think, as I touched upon very briefly earlier, um, shared charging spotting housing complex is always very tricky. And also simply because we don't really have the full picture yet of how electric vehicles are used. Because by understanding how our electric vehicles are used, will we really have the capacity to understand where to install the charging stations, what type of charging uh, facilities um, we can have. And of course, the, I think the, the benchmark or the baseline would be we have to understand the destinations and pit stops, which boils down to the very basic transport planning techniques to understand how those vehicles move. Otherwise, we won't be able to know maybe charging, whereas in the residential area, we could install just standard charging, whereas at the moment, we don't really have the full picture that makes, again, the shared charging spots in housing complex quite tricky because it's a residential area. But of course, we won't be able to satisfy all residents once they all have electric vehicles. Whereas do we have to set up, say, charge extra charging spots near the residential area on public land, which can be quite controversial. So spaces wise and location wise, we don't have the full picture yet. I think this is still something uh, we uh, have to say that, that is still a work in progress. And last but not least, I think learning by doing is what cities in Taiwan are still um, trying, to, um, trying, trying to master, if I may say, because um, uh, cities in Taiwan, even though like people think of Taiwan as a kingdom of say, oh, ICT, you guys have um, different sort of high-tech technology products and all that. But when it comes to the really the implementation and application of EU um, charging, I think we are on the same trajectory to learn how the best to install the electric vehicle charging infrastructures and how the best to uh, also jumping on this opportunity to transition to renewable energies.
So, so at the moment, policy really varies from city to city in this very early stage. So the example I gave early on is the example from Taichung City. Taipei City has its own example, has its own policy. Tainan and Kaohsiung have their own policy. And also the official guidelines remain to be seen. I think it's still at the very stage that cities are drafting their official guidelines, but at the end of the day, hoping that the integration of different successful stories and policies would be merged and integrated as a rule book for all cities uh, to look up to, to refer to. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, for the interest of time, I am hoping to share more uh, stories and the uh, information with you in the following trainings and hope you have the, the nice rest of the day. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Suri. Uh, indeed, the case of charging infrastructure in Taiwan is very interesting. 